in a fund that owns listed real estate the ability to gain as much exposure as they would like to the higher growth, lower correlation specialty property types. Hello and welcome to the REIT Report. I'm your host, Sarah Ball from Quito. My guest today is Andy Duffy, co-founder, chief investment officer, and senior portfolio manager of Ranger Global Real Estate Advisors, an independent investment advisor founded in 2016. Andy, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Well, Sarah, thank you, and thanks to Nairi. So, first of all, what are your views more broadly on the state of commercial real estate today, and how are you distinguishing between the performance of geographies and property types? Let's start at 100,000 feet with the observation that commercial real estate is a very simple business in that it obeys the economic law of gravity. By that, I mean supply and demand for space meet to set prices, which we call rent. For the traditional property types, defined as office buildings, industrial or warehouse space, multifamily apartments, and retail, there is a very high correlation between a country's economic growth rate and the value creation and returns on its commercial real estate. Looking at a regression analysis would show that there's about a 0.8 R-squared correlation between the two. Put another way, a country's GDP growth rate explains about 80% of the returns available on its commercial real estate. So that serves as a good starting point, but only a starting point, in that it helps inform or illuminate our search globally for winning investments. That's for traditional property types. For specialty property types, it ain't about GDP growth. Rather, each property type has its own differentiated primary driver of demand. They vary by property type, and they are also uncorrelated with GDP growth. By investing in specialty property types, thus, we can experience higher growth and returns that are uncorrelated with the returns on traditional property types, resulting in lower volatility on the overall portfolio. With all that said, Despite the current environment of exogenous factors, including macroeconomic uncertainty, geopolitical stress grabbing the headlines, commercial real estate fundamentals are healthy in most countries and most property types. That said, there are some exceptions in both directions, notably office buildings are experiencing significant challenges owing to the adoption of hybrid work models that are causing employers to reassess their space needs with an eye towards reducing the amount of space they need for their staff. As well, malls have been experiencing strong headwinds for years now owing to the so-called Amazon effect the disruptive impact of e-commerce, which also received a ramp up during the pandemic. On the other side, property types that are experiencing strong tailwinds include many of the specialty property types, notably data centers, which even before the pandemic were experiencing secular demand growth about the same as the growth of internet usage, so about 20 to 25 percent a year. Cell towers, another property type that was experiencing strong secular demand pre-pandemic, and the work from home, work from anywhere genie out of the bottle is resulting in even stronger demand for cell towers and wireless data transmission. Do you know the best strategies for decarbonizing the built environment? Are you interested in learning more about using AI in the workplace? 
Do you know how to effectively align your DEI targets with your business goals? Learn the answers to these questions and much more at Neeroots Rootworks Sustainability Conference, taking place June 28th and 29th in Las Vegas. Join professionals in sustainability, CSR, communications, DEI, finance and law for two days of educational sessions, roundtables and meaningful networking. Visit go.reet.com forward slash Reetworks Reet Report to register. That's go.reet.com forward slash Reetworks Reet Report. And Ranger Global has expertise investing in non traditional next generation property types like data centers and cell towers. What makes these segments compelling in the public markets and how do they perform relative to traditional property types? Building on the answer to the first question, it's back to supply and demand. Specialty property types are a very eclectic mix, including, as I've mentioned, data centers and cell towers, but also student housing, single-family home rentals, cold storage, self-storage, medical office buildings, life science or lab space, even timber. So yes, a very eclectic mix, but they tend to have two things in common. Thing number one, they tend to operate with more demand than supply. That disequilibrium of supply and demand conveys pricing power to the landlord, enabling them to raise rents higher and faster than is typically the case on traditional property types. The ability to push rents higher, faster, and generate better growth usually leads to better returns. The second thing that they have in common, tying back into, again, the answer to the first question, each one of the property types has a demand driver that's different than the others, and thus the uncorrelated nature of the demand and the resulting growth and returns can dampen the overall volatility on a diversified portfolio with significant enough specialty exposure. Let's drill down a bit. For example, data centers, it's about the growth of the internet. That's been compounding at a 20 to 25% rate. And now with work at home and work from anywhere and resulting hybrid work models, That's adding another layer of demand and resulting growth. And if that weren't enough, AI is entering the picture. And the widespread adoption and rollout of AI portends even more demand for Internet usage and growth in demand for data centers. Let's take cell towers. For cell towers... Demand is driven by wireless data transmission. That's been compounding at an even higher growth rate than simple internet usage, about 30% a year. And with cell towers and wireless data, there's now the rollout of 5G, which is expected to increase demand for wireless data transmission, adding another layer of demand onto cell towers. One more that's worthy of mention is student housing. Student housing is driven by growth in post-secondary student population. And the revealed truth is that during periods of economic challenge, like recessions, the propensity for people to either voluntarily or involuntarily leave work and go back to school is higher, resulting in an uptick in student population during the tough times, giving them almost a counter-cyclical profile. You run both global and U.S. REIT strategies. In light of what's transpiring in the world today, what are the advantages and the risks of investing domestically versus adding international exposure to one's portfolio? When I began my career about 30 years ago, That question would have been moot because it was virtually entirely a U.S. market. Today, the market is split about 50-50 between U.S. and international. And with the growth happening primarily outside the U.S., the direction of travel points to 
in five or ten years, likely there'll be a larger investable universe outside the U.S. than here in the States. Moreover, over the long sweep of time, going back to the beginning of the modern REIT era, the annualized returns on U.S. versus non-U.S. have been roughly comparable. So there's no clear advantage one way or the other based on returns. Thus, the primary advantage of investing globally is diversification, which is always a good thing for investors. Not only that, specialty property types and the companies that own and manage them are expanding faster both in number and in size outside the U.S. than here in the States. Thus, for the property types that offer the most bang for the buck, so to speak, we're finding them increasingly more available outside the U.S. Finally, Non-U.S. markets generally are less efficient than the U.S. market, creating more opportunities for investors like us to capitalize on and take money out of the market to enhance returns for our investors. Great. And there's been a lot of focus in the industry around the dislocation between private real estate and publicly listed REITs. In your opinion, is there an arbitrage opportunity and how long might that last? In a word, yes, there is. It's rooted in the two very different valuation methodologies employed in the public market compared to the private market. Public REITs are valued by the capital markets, which is a discounting mechanism that looks ahead six to nine months and prices in today the market's collective view and assessment of conditions that it expects to exist then. Whereas private real estate is valued via appraisals. By their nature, they're backward looking. And as such, the results of the appraisals are stale even on the first day that they're produced. The disconnect between the public market looking ahead and the private market looking through the rearview mirror is what results in the current scenario where public REITs sold off 20 to 25 percent in 2022, adjusting to higher interest rates. Private real estate has not yet experienced much, if any, of a decline yet. As appraisals, based on transactions that have occurred since the Fed and other central banks began raising rates, begin to filter into appraisals, we're going to see valuations in the private market decline. And that's how the spread between public and private markets that currently exists is going to be arbitraged away. And looking at the public real estate landscape, what do you see as the benefits and opportunities of investing in listed real estate funds versus some of the other vehicles? And how might you use public REIT funds to complement a real estate portfolio comprised of those less liquid portfolios? Two-part question, so a two-part answer. Part one, it begins with liquidity or lack thereof. Open-end real estate mutual funds afford investors liquidity on two levels. First, at the fund level, with daily unconstrained ability to access their capital. But not only at the fund level, within the portfolio, the managers are able to make adjustments in the portfolio's positioning and exposure virtually in real time and in a very efficient way, thus enabling them to adapt to changing market conditions as well as to avoid risk. Not the same in private real estate vehicles. But it's not just about liquidity. There's also a significant differential in diversification. A typical mutual fund that owns listed real estate will have a well-diversified portfolio, not only by geography, but also by property type. 
Moreover, specialty property types are much more readily available today in the public market, thus affording an investor in a fund that owns listed real estate the ability to gain as much exposure as they would like to the higher growth, lower correlation specialty property types. Great. And Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this episode of The REIT Report, please subscribe or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform.